Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Kristen Sanchez, and I welcome you today to today's virtual event. Um, so today we have a great presentation for you. We have Mr. Jeremy Parades, who's an Associate Professor of Kinesiology here at EPCC, and he's going to be talking to you today about body composition. Um, and for to, it, attending today's workshop, you have the opportunity to earn uh, Tejano passport points, which can go towards earning a medallion that you can wear at graduation. Um, so I'll be putting a code in the chat box in just a little bit. Um, and you'll be able to see more about how to register to get those points. Um, so again, thank you all for joining us. And Mr. Parales, whenever you're ready, go ahead and please begin. Well, thank you, Ms. Sanchez. Uh, so hello, uh, my name is uh, Jeremy Parales, and I am with the Department of Kinesiology, and I'm at the Trans Mountain Campus. Uh, so today, um, I'm just going to be sharing a little bit about uh, what body composition is, and also, um, body mass index and what the what the two are and what are the differences uh because a lot of times uh, we tend to get these things mixed up and i'm just gonna be explaining the differences today so let's go ahead and get started okay so um what is body composition so i'm sure everyone's probably heard the term body composition before um although you probably heard of body mass index even more so uh so what body composition is is it's actually looking at how much muscle we have and how much fat we have so it's looking at those primarily two, two of those things um, and also everything else in the body, but primarily how much muscle and how much fat. Okay, um, and why is that important, right? So why is it important how much muscle and fat we carry? Well, it's important because of three primary things. Um, mostly uh, everyone's concerned about this because of aesthetics or how we look, right? That's mostly when I ask that, why do you guys care about body composition? Everyone's like, oh, because we want to look good for the beach, right? Um, that's great, but the, the main reason should be our health. Right. So the main reason is health um, and uh, because we want to maintain a, a healthy lifestyle. If we have too much excess body fat, that can lead to issues such as like um, uh, type 2 diabetes or any other obesity related diseases. And also uh, another thing why we're concerned with body composition is health and also athletic performance. OK, so for athletes, uh, body composition is very important uh, regarding their sport. Uh, for some athletes, it's actually linked to their performance. Okay, so um, uh, for example, if you see the three, the picture here, there's three athletes. It's Blake Griffin, who's a basketball player, Hope Solo, who did soccer. And I don't know who the third person is, but I'm assuming they play baseball. Okay, so if you think about what common thing those three sports share, uh, basketball, soccer, and baseball, is sprinting, right? So depending on position also, sprinting is actually linked to body composition. So if you look at any of the, if you guys like watching the, the Olympics, like the summertime Olympics with the, the sprinting, like the 100 meter, 200 meter runs and stuff like that. Have you ever seen a sprinter? They're always extremely lean, right? You never seen a, a sprinter who has a lot of excess body fat. Okay. And that's because um, sprint performance is actually um, influenced by how much body fat we have. If we have too much body fat, then sprint performance is going to be hindered. Right. So um, usually that's why you'll never see sprinters who have a lot of excess body fat. In reality, they're very lean. They look like the every time I see sprinters, I mean, you see basically they're so lean. They remind me of like those uh, like the horses that just look awesome. Right. So they're really cool to look at. But anyway, uh, primary reason should be health, uh, athletic performance and also how we look. Right. That's the main reason for college students is we want, you know, college students want to look good for the summer. And that's pretty much everyone's main reason. Right. They want to look good. OK. So that's what body composition is, and that's why we care about it, why we should care. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about body mass index here a little bit. So body mass index is probably a term everyone's probably heard of or is more familiar with versus body composition. Okay, and like I said, these two things get uh, mixed up and changed, and they're two different things. Okay, so we said body mass, sorry, we said body composition is how much muscle and fat somebody has. Body mass index basically is a health risk assessment and it categorizes and places people into categories solely based off your height and your weight right so it takes somebody's height it says if you're this tall you should weigh this much okay now um that's not necessarily uh not the best indicator of health because um it doesn't take into account muscle or fat right so body mass index does not differentiate between fat mass and fat free mass so that means lean muscle and fat right it doesn't tell the difference between it it just says you should weigh this much for this for this height okay um 
so what it does, you can easily calculate calculate your BMI by taking your your um sorry your weight in kilograms and dividing it by your height in meters squared, and that'll give you a value. So let's just say, for example, somebody fell at like 30.5, right? Then that would put them in the obese category. So that this BMI would tell them they're obese solely based off their height and weight. Okay, but we can actually look at their body composition. And again, if you guys remember, body composition is actually looking at how much muscle you have and how much fat you have. Somebody can fall into the obese category and have like 5% body fat, right? So BMI is not necessarily a very good indicator of uh, fitness. So let's go ahead and move on a little bit. So here's an example of BMI and why it's not necessarily a good indicator. Um, because we have here Ezekiel Elliott, right? Most people are Cowboys fans. They love the Cowboys. Uh, I don't really watch football, so I'm, I'm fine either way. But we have Ezekiel Elliott, right? And I just got his information off Google. Quick Google search told me he's six feet tall and he weighs 225 pounds, right? And then I went to the CDC uh, just to do their calculation because I didn't want to have to pull out my calculator and, and look up kilograms and stuff like that. So uh, I just went to their uh, BMI calculator, right? And it says here for the information you entered, uh, height six feet zero inches, weight 225, right? 225 pounds. It says your BMI is 30.5. Okay, so 30.5, if we look back at that previous slide, it's classifying Ezekiel Elliott as obese, right? So it's saying he's obese based off his height and weight. So here, and it also says it here. It says your BMI is 30.5, indicating your weight is in the obese category for adults of your height. So if we were to tell Ezekiel Elliott, hey, uh, Zeke, uh, you fall into the obese category, right? He might be shocked, right? He might be like, what? Are you serious? Right? So, um, and we might also be too, right? So I'm pretty sure if I if I mentioned here to everybody that Ezekiel Elliott is classified as obese on the BMI, you'd probably be surprised. Okay, so that's because we're only looking at his height and weight, right? Body mass index only looks at height and weight, and it puts individuals into categories solely based on height and weight. What it doesn't do is it does not look at muscle or fat. Okay, so that's where we need to look at the body composition. So body composition, if we looked at Ezekiel Elliott's body composition, he might be in the neighborhood of like 10% body fat, which is really good. So, but if we don't know that and we told Ezekiel Elliott, hey, Ezekiel Elliott, you're, you, you're obese, right? He might get discouraged, right? So that might be um, information we giving, may be giving him that's not fully a complete picture of his overall health. Right. So his his uh, body composition is probably pretty good. So he's fairly healthy. He's pretty healthy. We wouldn't need to. This wouldn't be a cause for concern that he falls into the obese category. A lot of athletes actually would fall into the obese category or or morbidly obese because you have athletes who, uh, for example, are taller. Uh, they're heavier with muscle mass. So they're going to fall into some of these categories. Right. Or if you work out a lot, if you work out a lot, you might fall into the obese category. Um, but again, BMI does not take into account muscle or fat. It just categorizes individuals based off your height and your weight. Okay, and this is a, a good example of that. Okay, and then this is how it's taken. So we have uh, ways of assessing uh, individuals. Okay, we can do anthropometric measurements. So anthropometric measurements are basically um, hum measurements of human body fat dimensions through non-invasive quantitative techniques. So we're not uh, poking or prodding anybody. Right, we're simply using like tape measures or checking height, weight, things like that, that we can get a quantitative measure of. So height, we can get a quantitative measure. Weight, we can do that. Skin fold thickness, we can also doing a skin fold calipers. We actually can, which we'll cover right now in a bit. Uh, body circumference measurements, we can easily go to Walmart, get a tape measure for like 98 cents and do those uh, waist to hip measurements or, you know, measure the waist, measure the hip, measure the chest and get a quantitative measurement. Okay, so those are anthropometric measurements. Okay, so how do we assess body composition? Again, body composition is looking at how much muscle somebody has and how much fat somebody has. Okay, so here's a list. We're gonna go through each of these bullet points, but two of them are not uh, assessment tools of body composition. For example, BMI, we're gonna go back through that. BMI, it says, does not assess body composition and also waist to hip ratio. Waist to hip ratio does not assess body composition either. These other methods that we have, skin fold calipers, uh, BIA or biological impedance analysis, BOD pod, hydrostatic weighing, and DEXA scan are used to assess body composition. Okay, the gold standard though um, is through cadaver analysis, right? So uh, 
if you're familiar with cadaver, uh, that, that it doesn't matter at that point, right? So um, if you want to know with 100% accuracy how much body fat you have, we'll never know that while we're living. So that'd be done through cadaver analysis because they'd actually have to go in and get some of the muscle between the, sorry, some of the fat between the muscle and things. So nobody cares at that point, right? Uh, but the most accurate alternatives that we do have while we're alive are hydrostatic weighing and body pod. So hydrostatic weighing is, uh, we'll talk about in a bit, but it's basically plus or minus 2% off cadaver analysis. So let's just say, for example, um, a cadaver has 8% body fat, right? And then we can bring that cadaver back to life. Um, then his with hydrostatic, he can be anywhere from 6% all the way to 10% because it's plus or minus 2% off. So that's not too bad, right? That's pretty good for, um, you know, I'd pr much prefer the 2% difference while being alive. And then bod pod would be 2% off of hydrostatic. Okay, so these are two very accurate alternatives that we do have um, to assess body composition while we're alive. Okay, so let's go and get started on these. So body mass index, we already mentioned it. If you guys remember, uh, BMI only looks at your height and weight. So we use it as a health risk assessment for the population. Um, and, and I mentioned it's not necessarily the best measurement, but we still use it. And why do we use it? Well, because if we were to take a, just gather a huge sample of a population. So if we're just gather a huge sample of people in Texas and do a BMI on them, and let's just say a lot of people fell into the obese category. It's most of them, if they fell into the obese category, probably would have excess body fat. Okay, it's only a small percentage of those who would be like, for example, athletes and people who work out regularly and, and uh, who are fairly fit. They might they're going to fall into the obese category when they're when they're really not right. They actually are very lean and um, and healthy. But if we were to just take a whole bunch of people, if a bunch of people fell into the category of obese, well, chances are they probably do have quite a bit of excess body fat. Okay, so Ezekiel Elliott is like a an outlier, right? He's um in the small percentage of people who would fall into that and not have a lot of body fat. Okay, um, so that's why we still use it. But what it does again is it compares the ratio of body weight to height, and that's all it looks looks at is height and weight to put people in the categories of obese, right, normal, overweight, obese, and morbidly obese. But it does not distinguish between fat and muscle. Can okay, here's an easy example, a visual of how you can see that. Um, so here is a uh, two pictures, right? We have uh, four four individuals here, and if we look at their BMI, so again, BMI is only look at looking at height and weight. That's it. All four of these individuals, the scale and and the height measurement says height six feet. All four individuals are six feet tall, and all individuals weigh 250 pounds, right? So according to the BMI, these individuals are exactly the same, right? They they're all uh, let's see, 33.9. I think they'd probably fall into the obese category. They were they would all be considered obese, right? But if we look at them. Two of them, you can see the muscles, right? They look like bodybuilders, right? Like Ezekiel Elliott. Okay, so um, this is not necessarily a good indicator because of that issue, right? So BMI would say all four of these individuals are the exact same person. Okay, so that's why it's not necessarily a good indicator. And on the flip side, it can actually tell somebody they're normal when in reality they might have a lot of body fat. Okay, that uh, it can give somebody a false sense of security. Can this, in this instance, where it's classifying uh, two of these individuals who look like they have no body fat, it's classifying them as obese, which can, you know, if you told them that, they can get discouraged, right? And maybe develop an eating disorder or something like that. Um, and on the flip side of that, we can tell somebody, oh, you fall into the normal category, right? But if we were to take their body composition, they could potentially have, you know, 35% body fat, which is not necessarily a good thing, right? So it can give somebody a false sense of security, and it can also get somebody discouraged when they don't need to be discouraged. Okay, so that's why we want to not only do BMI, we want to, BMI is fine, but we want to go beyond that and check body composition and not just tell somebody they're normal, overweight, or more obese or morbidly obese solely based off their height and weight. Okay, so moving on. Um, here we have waist to hip. Okay, waist to hip ratio is also, if you remember on that list, it is not um, an assessment for body composition, but what it does do is it tells us how it tells us how we carry that weight, right? So how we carry our weight, where we carry it, that's up to our genetics, right? Uh, so if you have good genes, right, not Levi's, then 
then um, you can thank your parents <laughs> or bad ones can thank mom and dad too. Right. But um, what this is showing is usually uh, we'll carry the weights either in our abdomen, our midsection um, or in the hips. OK, so if we have good genetics, right, if we have the better good genetics, I guess we'll carry it in the hips. Right. We don't want excess body fat. But if we had a little bit of excess, then we want to carry it in the hips. Why is that? Well, we'd, we'd prefer to carry it in the hips because there's less vital organs for that fat to surround. So if we carry it in the abdomen section, well, we have all our vital organs right there, right? Um, so if we have a lot of excess body fat surrounding those, then that can create some health issues. So we don't want excess body fat, but if we did have some, then we'd prefer it in the hips. And we can't wear tighter shirts to push it down and you know, or tighter clothing to adjust it, right? That just, that, that won't work. So um, this is where we'd have to basically look at maybe, you know, putting together a plan for a diet and exercise to help reduce that. Okay. But what we can do to actually measure this is do a race, a weight, sorry, a waist to hip ratio assessment. And what that looks like is, um, it's going to look something like this. It's going to look like, um, taking a measurement around the narrowest part of the waist, which is your, uh, right above your umbilicus or your belly button and taking a measurement around the widest part of the hips, which is gonna be the glutes, right? The buttocks. And um, we're gonna basically take those measurements in centimeters and plug them in to our little you know, chart here. And we're gonna do waist divided by hip. We'll go waist girth divided by hip girth. And it's gonna give us a point value. So say for example, I'll use myself as, as an example. Let's say I did it, I measured my waist in centimeters and I measured my hip in centimeters. And uh, I got something like, and I'll use my age, so I'm 33. So let's just say I got a value of um, 1.0, okay? So if I got a value of 1.0, I would look over here and look at, uh, for men, 30 to 39. If I had a value of 1.0, man, I'd be in very high. So um, that's a cheap tool to get, right? Tape measures could be like 96 or 86 cents at Walmart. You go get one, you can do this test, you can monitor your health. And let's just say I got 1.0. Uh, that's going to tell me, hey, okay, I need to maybe start, um, you know, diet, maybe adjust my diet and start exercising. And let's say I do this, start doing that, start working out, start eating a little better. And then um, I assess myself in like six weeks, right? So I go from 1.0, let's say now I'm at like um, 0.91, right? And now if I look from 1.0, 0.91, hey, I'm going from very high risk to moderate risk now. So that's actually pretty good, right? It's letting me know I'm on the right path, right? So I'm putting myself at less at risk of developing obesity related diseases. So something as simple as a tape measure is something we can use to actually monitor our health. And again, waist to hip is not an assessment of body composition, but what it does do is it, it tells us how we distribute that body fat in our bodies. Okay, and, um, and it's a really cheap, fast, convenient way that we can assess ourselves periodically and make sure we're, we're doing okay. All right, so um, again, waist to hip doesn't tell us how much we have, it just tells us how we store it. Okay. All right, here is what's called skinfold calipers. These are actual tools to actually measure body composition. So these tools will tell us how much muscle and fat we have, but um, it is not necessarily a comfortable test. It's, uh, it has like little pinchers, right? They're like little claws. And um, it leaves you all red and marked up. Okay, so and not everyone's comfortable doing this test, right? So, um, there, excuse me. There's other methods we can use. Uh, this one is um, very accurate. It can be very accurate, but it depends on who's doing the assessment. Okay, so uh, whoever's doing the assessment needs to have experience doing it and doing it correctly, that they were trained properly. And uh, the the pros of this one is it's very fast, right? You can assess uh, like a hundred people very quickly. Um, or usually they'll use this with athletes. Uh, so I used to do this, uh, when I was in college at UTEP, uh, we had like every high school athlete from every district come and, uh, we had to do uh, skin folds on them and, or body composition assessments on them. And we would use this, we'd use the skin fold calipers because they're very quick, they're effective and they're practical when you're testing, you know, a thousand athletes. So, um, that's why we used it and you can do a seven site or three site male or three site female. So seven site is basically you do uh, measurements on like the tricep, the subscap, which is right below scapula. You would do the abdomen, or the thigh. Um, there, there's various other points. I uh, can't think of them all right now, 
uh, but you would do it basically, uh, you would do seven sites and you would do them triplicate. So you would go through all seven, three times. You'd do all seven sites, then all seven sites again, then all of them again. And each measurement should be relatively close together. And then we'd punch that into a, what's called a Siri or Brozek equation. And we would find out the body fat percentage of that individual and also how much muscle mass they have. And then we have alternates that are alternate options, such as the three site, which for three site, they usually do the, the triceps, uh, the subscapular and the chest, the pectoralis uh, major. So they usually take those three measurements and uh, calculate body fat percentage from that. And um, so again, this, the accuracy depends on the experience of the person doing the assessments. And there's also some cons with this. So the downside of these are, again, the experience, the person has to be experienced in doing it. And also um, they're not necessarily suitable for everybody, meaning if somebody is uh, very overweight. So if we have a client who um, is too overweight, the calipers only open so much, right? So it can be discouraging, let's just say for example, but if you have, if you have enough experience using them, then the person would know, okay, I'm not going to grab the calipers. I'm going to use a different device to assess the body composition so I don't discourage my client, right? So, but these, if I grabbed them and the client's too big, well, then the calipers won't work, right? And that could be discouraging for the client. So um, these are very accurate tools. Uh, they're fairly cheaper compared to other options. And by cheaper, they're still expensive. For example, these green ones are about like uh, around $315. And they have cheap plastic ones that could be like 25, 40 bucks. Um, they work the same pretty much, um, but they're not initially pleasant to do. Cause uh, again, like I said, they leave you all marked up in red um, and you cannot do them on yourself. So you have to have somebody else do it for you. And again, they have to be experienced in it. And um, usually all measurements are always taken on the right side of the body. The reason for that is for consistency across labs, much like uh, you know, in research, um, you know, we use kilograms, meters, meters per second. We don't use pounds. Um, the reason for that is again, consistency across labs because research is international. Uh, same thing with this, it's international. We, we have to um, always do the right side of the body for consistency across labs. But if there's to say an injury, uh, if there's an amputation or an injury, then that's the only time we do the left side. But for consistency, we always do skin folds on the right side of the body. Okay, here's another device we use for assessing body composition. And this one's more common. Um, you probably have one of these in your house or you've probably used one before or seen one before. Uh, this is what's called a bioelectrical impedance analysis and it, or a BIA. And what it does is it sends an electrical current through your body. You don't feel it, right? You're not getting shocked or anything. Um, but it sends a small electrical current that goes through your body. And the faster that signal travels, then that's indicating you have more muscle mass or you're leaner. Um, the slower that signal travels, then that's indicating you have, there's more resistance to the current. That means there's more fat mass. Uh, so we really want that signal to fly. That's what we want, right? Um, and there's ways to manipulate it, right? So like I said, this one you've probably seen before. A lot of gyms use this, but they don't really explain how it works. Um, so with this device, there are some limitations. If you, uh, for example, have drank a lot of water, like I said, this thing uses electricity. So if you drink a lot of water, um, then that signal is going to travel a little faster, right? And if you know that, if you know, you know, water is a good conductor of electricity, then you can influence these, these results, right? Or if you're underhydrated. So if you're overhydrated, you'll appear leaner. Or if you're underhydrated and you haven't had enough water, then you're going to appear like you have more body fat right? Or if you worked out, okay, that'll influence the results. If you use the restroom, if you didn't use the restroom, okay, those things will also influence the results on this device. Okay, so the recommendations are um, to avoid physical activity for about 12 hours prior to doing it. And for eating and drinking, not to eat, any, eat or drink anything, I think it's like four hours prior. Okay, so that, that would give you better results, but this is not the most accurate device. But it's used a lot because it's cheap, it's fast, it's convenient. Right, you can use a handheld one like you see in the middle, and you could just put that in your desk drawer. Um, the scale, you can literally slide under your office uh, desk or at home under your bed or wherever. Um, so typically, gyms will use these, and um, but again, not fully explain how they work. Uh, these are good to have because um, they give you a ballpark estimation, right? So it may not be the most accurate, 
but it gives you a ballpark estimation and it gives us something we can work with. Okay, and some of these things could be up to like $4,000 um, and some could be as cheap as like, um, like $45, okay, but the price doesn't make it more accurate. Okay, what the price does is it can change, it can alter the range it picks up, right? For example, the handheld ones, I have some in my office here. Um, the handheld ones reading the manual, it'll say if somebody is less than 5% body fat, it will not pick them up, right? The screen will actually read error, okay? Or if they have too much, okay, if they have too much body fat and um, they have above like say 30% body fat, then the machine will also not pick it up and it'll say error. Okay, that's good to know also. Okay, so regardless of the device, um, whoever's doing the administering the test wants to know that because you know if I if I can tell my client's going to be outside that range, I don't want to use this device. Okay, uh, but if you bought a more expensive one, then it probably will pick up the less than five percent body fat or over thirty percent. Right, that's really what you're doing is when you pay more for it, you're just getting more of a range that it picks up versus how accurate it is. Okay, but it is a fairly good um, device to have uh, and to use. So, but that's how it works is it uses electrical currents. So you can influence the results of this one fairly easy. Okay, uh, next one, we have what's called a bod pod. Um, so this one, if you remember, this one's actually one of the very accurate alternatives. However, you could probably tell from just looking at it, it's pretty expensive, right? It's definitely more than a couple hundred bucks. Uh, I think we're looking at uh, like maybe 25,000, right? So it's like buying a car almost for this probably. Um, but this device is really accurate. Um, it's not the, it's, it's also kind of cool. I was about to say it's not the funnest to use, but it actually is pretty fun. Uh, you basically go in there. If you see the picture that the gentleman's wearing a swim cap. Okay. So the whole point of this is it uses air displacement. So we want to put a swim cap on because within your hair, you have uh, air molecules, right? So all that will be picked up as excess body fat. All the air trapped in your hair will be picked up as excess body fat. So they compress it uh, so it's not picked up, right? So th they'll usually have individuals wear swim caps. Um, and for the, for the men, they'll have them wear like compression shorts. Uh, for females, they'll have them wear compression shorts and sports bras, right? So that, and, and the cap, right? So everything's compressed and th the results are more accurate. So with this one, it's minimal clothing, right? And, and even with that minimal clothing, it's gonna be compression clothing versus like swim trunks or bathing suits, because with those things, you still have air that's trapped in them. So that gets picked up as excess body fat. So um, this one is a cool thing to do. Uh, however, the limitations are it's very expensive um, and it's also relatively small in the, in the pod there. Every time I see this thing, I always think of uh, Planet of the Apes, the older, I mean, not the old, old ones, but the relatively older ones now, uh, where like Caesar gets sent up in a little space pod, right? I always think of like a space chimp, but uh, it's really cool. And, uh, you know, when they put you in, you have the air displacements, so you have a bunch of like pressure, you just hear it like it's taking off and you have to be pretty still because if you move around in it, then all that moving is going to be picked up as, you know, excess body fat. So you're just sitting there pretty still. And the cool thing about this one is the computer does all the math for you. So that's why it's really expensive, right? You don't have to do any math at all. So that's why it's great. Um, very accurate. The downside is it's expensive. Um, it takes up space. As you can see, it's, it's, it does take up some space, requires certain electrical um, out it, you know, power and stuff. And then also it has to be recalibrated between each individual. So what they'll do is they'll measure somebody. They have, before they put somebody in there, they have to put this uh, spherical cylinder in to calibrate the the device and then they'll take it out and then they'll have the, the individual go in they'll do the assessment and then they'll come out so this is pretty timely uh so well not super bad but if even if it's like 20 minutes uh for, per person uh that'd be a headache for somebody if you had to do 100 people that'd be a very long time so usually this device is not used when you have a lot of people to test uh, it is very accurate and it's but limited to accessibility you only see these like pretty much at universities, uh, on colleges and stuff like that, or maybe clinics or hospital settings, maybe, um, but more university in regards to research. Um, but they are cool to, to do. So, and it's one of the more accurate alternatives. Okay, and hydrostatic weighing. This one was the most accurate alternative. Um, and as you could probably tell, this one is also uh, a pretty penny because it requires 
uh, quite a bit of space and some water, right? So this one is uh, is not the cheapest either, but it's very accurate. This uses uh, Archimedes principle, and basically you're getting the water density from, and sorry, you're calculating the density uh, from volume and mass, and you have to get the water density from a chart. So basically you, you get the temperature uh, and you have to look at a chart and, and figure out the water density and all this kind of stuff. Uh, there's a lot of things you have to factor in and then you put them into a equation, a Siri or Brozic equation, and then you can calculate body fat percentage and muscle mass. So um, this one does require a lot of math and um, it does require water. And also with this one, um, it is the most accurate, but people can get uh, a little scared of doing it, especially if you have a phobia of being in a close, uh, enclosed spaces or um, small spaces or a, a water. Right. So with this one, you have to get your whole body wet, your hair and everything. So we would usually have somebody instruct them to get in the tank. Uh, so I've done one. I used to do this uh, before and uh, we'd have we had a tank. Right. So it'd be like the bottom picture. It'd be a circular tank. And we instructed the individuals to get in. Uh, they'd have to get their hair wet. So they'd you know, dunk their head in the water and then come up. So they were all completely wet and they would we just had a bar. They would get on a bar and basically place their weight on the bar. And we'd instruct them to basically take a deep breath, go underwater and blow as many bubbles as you can, make all the bubbles you can, right? And so all the air's out and, you know, and I would always tell them, hey, you know, like try and sit at the bottom of the pool like you used to do when you were kids and just watch life go by, right? The goal is to sink, right? So getting all the air out of the lungs, okay? Because any air that was left in the lungs would be picked up as excess body fat. So we wanted to sink. We don't want to float, okay? Um, so that would encourage people. They would really try and get all the air out. They blow all the bubbles. And then when the bubbles would stop, we'd basically take a measurement on this uh, scale. You could see in the bottom picture, it looks like a produce scale, right? Like every time I did it, I made it made me feel like I was shopping for groceries, right? Hey, it's like a, like bananas or something, right? But basically I would take measurements on that scale. Uh, I would tap on the tank and then they'd come up, right? So I'd, I'd tell them, hey guys, like you're gonna get in the water, go down, make all the bubbles you can. Uh, if you need to come up at any point, just come up, right? Don't don't wait for me to tap on the tank, but I'll tap on the tank when I get the reading, and that's when you can come up, right? But some people really had a fear of that, of even just going under the water a little bit. And where I was at, they, every time they'd go forward, you'd always bump their head on the tank. It's not hard, but I would always let them know because that kind of scared people. Like, all right, you're gonna when you go under, your head's gonna tap the tank, so don't freak out, right? Um, but it's the most accurate uh, method we have of assessing body composition. But as you can probably tell, it is fairly expensive, requires a lot of water, and requires maintenance. Luckily, when I was uh, doing this, uh, my partner I was working with, he also worked at a pool cleaning company. So yeah, he he would uh he he would clean it. I'd get in there and help him, but he he'd uh, he'd do all the cool cleaning stuff with all the chemicals and whatnot. So um, it requires a lot of maintenance and upkeep as well. Okay, and these you'll usually see at universities more for the more for research. Okay. And then we have what's called a DEXA scan. Okay, this one looks very expensive and it's very fun. Um, it's cool to do uh, because you get a printout of your skeleton. Like you, you see this uh, picture here, it shows the skeleton. And that's exactly what the, the ladies seeing on the computer screen there. This is the image just blown up. And uh, you can see the skeleton and everything. So it's really fun to do and really cool to see afterwards. The reason, um, so, sorry, the primary function of this machine is to actually measure bone mineral density. It measures bone mineral density. An additional perk of it is body composition. So, um, most people tend to think this one's the most accurate because it's very expensive. It looks fancy, but it's not, right? It, but the nice thing about it that the other ones don't do, this one is relatively accurate, but the best thing about this one is it actually tells you how much body fat you have in each region of the body. Right. All the other devices we just covered, they tell you how much body fat you have collectively, right, in general from head to toe. This one tells you how much you have, you know, in the torso, in the head, right, in the right arm, left arm, leg, right leg, left leg, right, it tells you how much you have in each segment of the body. So that's really cool. And that's actually beneficial to know for research. Um, for example, I, I use this one for my research when I was in grad school. Uh, for sprint training because I did a sprint training study and I saw a lot of research that showed uh, people who had greater thigh circumference had faster sprint times. Uh, so that but that was kind of weird. That was an older study. Um, but what I did to further that was like, well, is it greater thigh circumference or is it how lean the greater thigh circumference is, like the lean mass? 
And we did this to identify how much lean muscle mass somebody had in their upper thigh, right? So um, instead of just taking the measurement, we actually looked at how much muscle and fat was in the upper thigh region. So that's what DEXA can do. It's really cool. It can tell us again how much body fat we'd have in each segment. But the primary function of this device is to measure bone mineral density. Okay. So these are just some of the tools we have to assess body composition. And then why do we measure again? Well, both are important, right? Both are used in health. Like I said, BMI um, primary function is uh, to categorize individuals into categories based solely off their height and weight. Okay, so that's not the best, but we still use it and that's perfectly fine. But if we use it, we just want to further it and look at the body composition as well. Because we don't want to tell somebody, hey, you fall into the obese category and then not say anything else, right? Because that might not be, they might be healthy. They might be perfectly fine, okay? And an example of this, uh, for example, for me, I actually, when I was a student at grad school um, doing kinesiology and I learned about all this, I remember trying to be in a study myself um, through another department and they were, BMI was one of the requirements, one of the criteria, the exclusion criteria was you couldn't be obese, I, I believe it was. And uh, they did my BMI and I came out as obese. So um, luckily I know about body composition. So I was like, okay, that's all good. I'm all right. You know, but if I didn't, the way they kind of said it was like, Hey, yeah, sorry, you can't be in the study. You're, you're obese. And, um, and if I didn't know about that, then I'd probably be like, oh man, that's not, that's not good news. Right. I'd feel depressed. I'd feel a little sad about that. So it's very important how we deliver that information. Um, and also being aware of, you know, if I fall into that category, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm unhealthy because I need to look at my body composition. And on the flip side, if I fall into the normal category on BMI, that might give me a false sense of security because I may fall into the normal BMI, but I might have a lot of body fat. So that's why we don't want to just do BMI. We want to also do BMI, but investigate the body composition of the individual to confirm whether they're, whether basically should they be in this category or should we, um, you know, they're, or they're perfectly fine, right? They're healthy. Okay, so it's always important to go back and follow up and do body composition. But we measure for that reason and to assess for obesity and obesity related diseases. And we want to um, allow for prescription of desirable body weight, right? So if you're going to work out, if you know, we always want to find out where we are. If we have body fat, everyone does, We all, but we want to be in optimal range. Okay, um, and we all have a starting point. So we want to do an assessment. We have to do an assessment to find out where we are. Otherwise, we can't improve, right? So we want to find out where we are, and then we can improve on there, from there. So, so uh, for males, ideally, we want to be bet uh, below 20% body fat, and for females, between 16 to 25%. And here, that does change a little bit with age. You can see to the right, uh, according to the American College of Sports Medicine, these are the recommendations based off age, right? But all in all, we want to make sure we don't have too much, okay? Just like with everything, uh, if we overeat, right, we gain weight. If we, um, you know, expend more energy than we're intaking, we lose weight. If we um, intake more than we're expending, we gain, right? We want to have a balance in all these things. So there's nothing wrong with having a little bit of body fat or having some body fat. We just want to make sure it's within the optimal range, okay? Because we want to be healthy. Um, if it's too low, there's other issues that can happen when body fat percentage is too low. But, you know, again, that's why we want to maintain an optimal range of body fat and not worry so much about the weight uh, too much. Too many times I think we look at the scale and we think, um, oh man, uh, for example, when I when I used to do the, the body composition for the athletes, the high school at UTEP, they'd come in, they'd step on the scale and they'd see the scale and they'd see a number and they'd be like, oh man. And I think that's just something we're, we're taught to think. You know, they'd see the scale and they think, oh, I'm, I'm fat, you know? And um, because it's a, a number that they don't like. Now, I wouldn't say that and that when we do the body composition, we can't tell them what it is, but you know, a lot of them, they were very lean, right? So that's good. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about the scale number. We want to look at how much of that weight that you're carrying. Is it muscle or is it fat? And we want it to primarily be muscle because the weight's not the issue, but how much of that weight is fat. And that's where the issue is. If we have too much excess body fat, then we can have obesity related diseases. So we just want to make sure we're keeping that in check, right? But with that being said, that concludes the presentation. 
Uh, thank you all so much for your time and attention. And uh, here's my information. If you all have uh, questions or if you ever want to reach out, you're always uh, feel free to do so. Thank you all so much. Thanks so much, Jeremy. That was a great, pre great presentation. Hey, I have a question for you. So um, you were talking about how weight distribution or fat distribution is genetic. So what about uh, a lot of times I had heard, you know, like if you have jobs where you sit down a lot, that's where your weight will settle and things like that. Does that have any kind of merit? Um, to my knowledge, not necessarily. Uh, just gen genetics will determine where you store it. Okay. So I mean, like, yeah, so that's why I mean, Kind of like even even uh, things so, so even like for example type two diabetes you know um, stuff like that's gonna if both parents have it um, gonna have an increased risk not that the you know a child would get it but they're at an increased risk of getting it like um, and for me myself I had some I went to the doctors and like some some things that they were looking at like uh, everything was good but then there was like one thing to like oh uh, it's genetic right? They're like, you can do this, this, and this, and it's, mm -hmm. you know, so you have to pay extra attention to certain things if it's genetic. So okay. some things we can improve, and yeah, unfortunately, the where we store it, that's, that's, yeah, we just got to thank our parents for that one. <laughs> <laughs> some people inherit money, we inherit genetics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you so much. So does anybody yeah. have any questions? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again. We appreciate you coming and we appreciate all of you coming today as well. Um, I did put in the chat a link so that you can get to Hano Passport Points for attending today's session. I'm going to go ahead and share with you the uh, Tahano Passport information up here on the screen. When you attend different events here at the college, you can see if they have Tahano Passport Points and you can get points um, stored up and earn your way towards a medallion that you can wear at graduation. Um, so that's what this is um, you're seeing up here on the screen. Um, and also, I'd like to invite you to come next Friday. We will have another workshop. It's going to be by um, the SSSP program, and they're going to be talking about test anxiety. So that would be a great one to come and learn how to help yourself during those testing times. So if you all don't have any questions, I thank you all again for coming. Thank you, Mr. Parales, again for your presentation, and I hope you all have a great weekend. Thank you.